All right, friends. Hope College right here. Hey, brother. So good to have you back. We've been a little bit away from the gathering because of winter break, but we're back at it now. We've got this nice stretch from now until spring break. And if you're joining us at the gathering, um, we've been traveling through the prologue of John, verses 1 through 18 of chapter 1, the prologue. It's one of my favorite scriptures. And I gave a challenge early that anyone who memorizes the prologue would get a steak dinner. And then I changed that. Anyone who memorizes the prologue gets one of my, one of my famous burgers, because it's actually better than a steak dinner. My friend Jordan Hooker is taking up the challenge, and he is going, yeah, give Jordan some love, yes. He's a senior, ladies and gentlemen, from Grand Rapids, Michigan. He's a public accounting major, he is single. I don't know, Cy, why you're clapping out there, but <laughs> he is, uh, he's internalized the prologue, and he's going to offer it for us now. Hear the word of the Lord from the book that we love, the bush that burns and is never consumed, John 1, 1 through 18. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. And what came into being through him was life, and that life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. John came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens all people, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, but the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, but his own people did not accept him. But to those who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the power to become children of God, born not of blood or the will of man or the will of the flesh, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and he cried out, this is he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. And from his fullness we have received grace upon grace. Indeed, the law was given through Moses, grace and truth through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, that has made him known. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yes, yes, brother. Brother Jordan. The invitation and the challenge is still available. Internalize the scripture, film it, send it to me either through a text or an email, or volunteer to offer it to gathering, and you too, you too, shall want to be one of the elite who savors the incredible, satisfying experience of a Trig V burger. <laughs> it may change your life, but more that will change your life is the prologue to get that scripture in you and to let it speak to you, to let it be like the best music pressed into vinyl so that any time, any place, no matter what circumstance you are in, you can put the needle down and hear that good news. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Oh, I love me some prologue of John. When I feel like Christianity is just too confining, or too culturally conditioned, or drawn too emotionally narrow, I, I read the prologue. When I find that my language is so dull that it's lulling you to sleep and me to sleep, I read the prologue because the prologue shakes me awake and it launches me into a larger geography of circumference of the kingdom of God where I'm encountering a larger consequence. The prologue is like a key that unlocks us from the presumed world in which most of us are trapped and so desperately want to flee. And it allows us to get outside of ourselves, outside of our little, small cul-de-sacs, so that we can find our feet on a narrow path that leads us into that wide open country of salvation. And there where our feet is on that narrow path that leads us through a city where the streets have no name, farther up and further into the high country of the Trinity, where the air is thin, but the glory is thick. The prologue, take some time for yourself for your life, to get that inside of you. I love the prologue 
because it reminds me something fundamentally about the nature of God. The whole point of the gospel of John that's written is so that you can come to know that Jesus Christ is the Lord and by believing in him, you might have life in his name. In other words, the whole point of the prologue and everything that follows all the way to chapter 21 is simply so that you might know God. And if you know God, you will know the nature of God. And if you know the nature of God, you know something to expect. And there's no better place to capture the nature of God in the prologue than in John 1, 3 through 5, which is where we're going to camp out tonight. I want us to spend some time focusing on these two verses. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing has come into being. And what has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. John 1, 3 through 5. Two verses that launch us into that wide open country of salvation. Two verses that teach us two fundamental things about the nature of God that we forget at our own peril, that we ignore at, at the expense of, our, of, of wisdom. Two things I want to highlight tonight from these two verses that we should expect. We spent the last time talking about the very point that, God, that John wants us to know the Word, who is God. But if we know the Word, we should expect something from this God. And chapter, in verses 3 through 5, tells us what to expect. If I was to pick a compass for us at the college, it might be just verse 3. All things came into being through him. Without him, not one thing has come into being. And what has come into being in him was life. Let's, let's memorize that together. It's a little verse. Say it after me. All things. All things. All things came into being through him. What has come into being in him was life. And the life was the light of all people. Well, that's actually two verses, but that don't matter. It's still good. So let's say it together with me. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing has come into being. And what has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. I love that. This little verse gives us a compass to orient us into that large geography of the kingdom of God. All things came into being through him. It's a remarkable statement. The him that it mentions is referencing verse one and two. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, the word. We will find out that the word is the revealed person with the face, the name, the hands, the heart, the feet of Jesus Christ. All things came into being through him, which means that all things have a corresponding reality to Jesus. It's a remarkable claim. Now, of course, he's remixing Genesis 1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered over the face of the deep and a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated light from the darkness. Light he called day, the darkness he called night. There was evening, there was morning. Ah, oh, the first day. Yeah, that's what John's picking up on, but he's doing it in such a way that we do not miss the fundamental point, that all things came into being through him, through the word. In other words, Jesus Christ was at that beginning in Genesis. It means that he is eternal. All things came into being through him. Now I want to get geeky with you, really geeky with you, um, preacher geeky with you. Do you know what the Greek word for all means? It means all. <laughs> all things means all. All means is all-encompassing. All things came to be in three. It didn't mean Jesus made some things. Part of the thing, no, it means Jesus made all the things. Everything that you see, feel, taste, and touch, everything that you research, everything that you think about or explore has some correspondence to Jesus. Why? All things came to be in through him, and without him, not one thing is coming to being. And that includes you. That includes that person you can't stand. It includes the family that you're ostracized from. 
It includes your best friend. It includes the dirt under your feet. It includes the giraffes and the dolphins and the stars in the sky. Lake Michigan and its currents, the smells, the sights, the beauty, the form, everything, all things came into being through him. Do not miss the point that Jesus is more than a buddy. Jesus is more than just someone who's trying to encourage you along the way. No, Jesus is the very God who creates all things. All things came into being through him. I don't know if there could be a better verse for a college that is guided by the governing dynamics of a mission in the historic Christian faith. Why? Because a college is a safe place set aside to explore, to research, to think about, to question, to debate all things. All things means that you don't need to make your studies an extra thing. It is part of your spiritual thing. All things is why we have a library. All things is why we go over and do research and, and learn about photosynthesis. All things is why we have benches to sit along and have conversations. All things is what we're here to explore and to wonder about. Why? Because Jesus made all things. We opened up this new campus ministry house just over there, the Heist. If you come right in and right to the right, the first thing you'll notice is a big fireplace. Why? Because I like fire. <laughs> I like fire. It creates warmth. We'll get to that in a second. But if you go into that room, you'll notice that there are lots of bookshelves. And on those bookshelves are the great books of the tradition. Only good books are allowed in that room. There's no screens. There's nothing else. Because college is at heart a conversation where you talk and think about all things. And I just wanted the space for you to be invited in, and you are invited in, all of you, to just sit there and have a conversation, to have a safe place that's warm and cozy in the, the dark February moments, that you might experience the kinds of relationships and the kind of knowledge and the kind of learning that we are all about at Hope College that might invite us to make that learning relate to the source of all things, Jesus Christ. Hope College is a place where you are invited to study as part of your spiritual life. And you see, the, the verse three and four, all things came to be through him, without him not one thing has come to being in him, also means a personal invitation to realize every part of you belongs to Christ. And sometimes as a pastor, people will come to me anxious about their spiritual life. Am I doing enough? Am I praying enough? Am I X, Y, or Z? And we start shooting on ourselves. And, and there's a good thing in that. But here's one of the things that I, I, I like to try to get people to do. One, take a deep breath. And two, reframe the question. How do I improve my spiritual life is the wrong question. It's the wrong question because there's no such thing. There's no such thing as a spiritual life. There is just life. Your spiritual life, what we're doing here in chapel, is not divorced from your studying life. It's not, it's not separate from your friendship life or your family life or your dating life or any other part of your life. We have this kind of idea that we can kind of fragment and manage all of these different lives. But my friends, all things came to being through him, which means all of you comes to Christ. There's no fragmentation. One of the things that I love about being in a tradition that I'm in, a reformed tradition, is that it is a theological, um, it's a theological tradition that believes that every part of you, every square inch belongs to Christ. And so in your life, is all things belonging to Christ right now? Your weekend life, your dating life, your late night life, your studying life. Bend all of your life back to the source. And if you do, what you can expect is God to show up and create 
See, that's the thing. That's the thing that his nature teaches us. What does God do? God creates. He created things in the beginning for sure, but God's nature never ends, which means that God is always in the business of creating something new. And when God creates something new, it's called life. If I could give a baccalaureate speech, it would be go out into the world and make some life. Bring life back to a neighborhood. Bring life back to a relationship. Get married and make life. I am about life. Christians are a people who love life. Why? Because all things came into being through him. Without him, not one thing is coming to being. And what is coming to being in him was life. God is in the life business. God loves life. And those that love God need to love life, protect life, be all about life. No matter what circumstance you are in, God can create something new. In the very beginning, God created the sun, the moon, the stars, the land, the sea, the mammals, me, and you, which means that any time, any place, God can do the same thing and create a new circumstance. God creates out of nothing. There is no circumstance that you are facing, no darkness that you are in, that God cannot show up and by the power of his word, create something new. That's what you can expect from God. If you want to know God, know a God who creates something new, and that something new will be akin to life. And the way he describes that is the second thing that we should expect. It is like light, a light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. If we know the nature of God, we should expect that God will create, because all things came into being through him. And the second thing is, we should expect that God will show up. That's what light does. I love that image of light, which is why when you walk in the heist, one of the first things you see is this fireplace, because light and fire is the very symbol of God. It's a symbol of the Holy Spirit, the pillar of fire that's taking the people of God through the desert. It is light that exposes the dark. It is light that gives the truth. It is light that illuminates all things. When you walk in the house, I want you to, there to be a subtle reminder that we see light. I love the image of light because light is the very presence, a very presence, and it's powerful. You go into a room that's dark, and just light a match and see if that darkness does not flee from a little simple, ooh, bad metaphor, <laughs> match. A little light can go a long way. I love this story of Kenneth Bailey, a New Testament professor. It was when the fall of um, the communist states were going down in the early 90s, the Iron Curtain fell. And he went over to teach young Christians about the Bible. He was in Riga in uh, teaching Latvian Lutheran church. And he was with a group of people that were about 25 to 30 years old, which meant that they had spent their entire education life in the communist system that was bent on indoctrinating them into atheism. So he was curious, how did these young people become Christians? And he asked this young woman, how did you come to faith? And she, he said, was there a was there a church in your village? He said, no, 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 the, the communists shut those all down. Did you have a, a saintly grandmother that taught you the ways of God? No, everyone in my family was an atheist, she said. Well, then he asked, was there a secret Bible study or an underground church that you got connected to that brought you to Jesus? No, there was nothing like that. He said, well, how did you become a Christian? And she said that at funerals we were allowed to hear the Lord's Prayer, recite it. And when I was a young girl, I would hear these words, and I would wonder to myself who we were talking to, where these words came from, what they meant, and why we were saying them. And when freedom came at last, I had the opportunity to search out their meaning. And she said that when you are in total darkness, the tiniest point of light can be very bright. And for me, the Lord's Prayer was that tiniest point of light. And by the time I searched out its meaning, I was a Christian. A little light can illuminate all that is dark. That's what 
the nature of God does. God shows up as light for us. If you are in a dark moment, situation, context, I want to encourage you to hold on because the light will find you. The light will come. I love this poem, How the Light Comes by Jan Richardson. Let me see if I can pull it up. So good. She writes, I cannot tell you how the light comes. What I know is that it is more ancient than imagining, that it travels across an astounding expanse to reach us, that it loves to search out what is hidden, what is lost, what is forgotten, or in peril, or in pain, that it has a fondness for the body, for searching, finding its way towards flesh, for tracing the edges of form, for shining forth through the eye, the hand, the heart. I cannot tell you how the light will come, but that it does, that it will, that it works its way into the deep darkness that enfolds you, and though long ages it may take to reach you, or it may appear in a shape you did not anticipate, but on this day, let us turn towards it. Let us li lift our faces and let it find us. Let us bend our bodies and follow the arc that it makes. May we be open. May we be open more. May we be open still to the blessed light that comes. I love that. I do not know how the light will come, but that it does and that it will and that it will work its way into the deepest dark that enfolds you. That it has a propensity for the body, for finding its way towards flesh. And that's the good news of the gospel, is that God shows up as light in the flesh. We heard Jordan say it, and the word became flesh and lived among us. The light that God makes is the word. And the word shows up in time and space and history as light from true light. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is still showing up. And so no matter what circumstance you're in, my friends, or what you're struggling with or what you're questioning, hang on and expect that God will create something new for you and expect that God will show up and it will be light. Amen? Friends, let's pray. Eternal God, we thank you for this night that we get to be together. We never get to live this day again, and so we're grateful for the opportunity to be in Dimnit Chapel, to hear your word, and to know your nature, that you are a God that creates something new, and that you are a God that shows up like light, a light that overwhelms the darkness so, Lord, we ask that you will continue to keep showing up. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all the people said, amen.